Architecturally, Athens is known primarily for its great monuments, and given the grandeur of the Parthenon and other structures, it's not hard to see why. However, Classical Athens also featured a large number of private homes, which were every bit as much a part of the life of the polis as the buildings populating the Agora and the Acropolis. Here, we will examine the remains of Athenian homes and consider how Athenian homes reflected the realities of family life, business, and social values. Let's begin by talking about what we do and don't have at Athens when it comes to houses. First off, most of the perishable materials are long gone. The soil in Athens and in the surrounding area Attica are not ideal for the preservation of things such as ancient wood. There are other parts of the Greek world where we have better preserved homes. And because we know that, socially speaking, Athens was fairly typical of the Greek world, unlike, say, Sparta, we know that Athenian homes would have looked a lot more like the homes at, say, Olynthus that have been much better preserved. And so we can, by way of analogy, get a pretty good feel for what these homes would have looked like in their prime. What we do have are basically just the stone foundations and occasionally other remains of things that are more durable. So we sometimes find stairwells, which indicates that these were two-story homes. We sometimes find roof tiles and other things. Pottery sherds famously are prone to survive. And this can give us a general sense of how much material wealth the house possessed or how much uh, activity was going on there. One area of Athenian homes which has been much, much worse preserved than most other uh, places in the Greek world are the kitchens. We have very little evidence of what the Athenians had in their kitchens. Most scholars think that an Athenian kitchen was largely limited to a tripod that would feature a, fi a fire with an open flame and which would then be used to heat a large pot to, in order to boil food. And so this is how the Athenians would uh, prepare their soup and other meals, typically speaking. The Athenians, just like the other Greeks of the classical period, tended to build their houses in a very specific manner. That being said, the exact layout of the rooms could vary from house to house. All Greek homes during this period, or at least the vast majority, were centered around a courtyard, and that is due to the heat. This was one way to keep the temperature at a manageable level for the inhabitants of the home. A few rooms would be easily accessible to visitors. The Andron, which is the men's quarter, the place where guests are received, the workshop or storeroom where the family would either store its valuables or would host uh, people who came there for their services, and the courtyard, which was, of course, the sort of centerpiece of the home, all of these things would be easily accessible from the outside. But the more private areas, such as the women's quarter and some of the other rooms at the back that were living spaces, wouldn't be as easily accessible, and in fact, visitors would rarely, if ever, get a chance to see those areas. Most homes were two stories. There are occasionally... Um, hence that there might have been three-story homes here or there, but for the most part, most Athenian houses were only two stories. And despite the fact that we know that dramatic inequality existed in terms of wealth and power between different Athenians, most of these homes are relatively equal in terms of size and very, very similar in terms of their functions. So, keep that in mind. The difference between the house of Nicias, who was the wealthiest man in Athens and owned a thousand slaves, would not have been that dramatic when compared with a humble citizen or a medic or resident alien or even a well-off slave who is living independently. And yes, that is a thing that happens in Athens where some slaves who are skilled workers will be allowed to be the head of their own household and then just pay something of a retainer to their master. And just from by looking at a house, you wouldn't really be able to tell the exact status of the person living there. 
So that is one of the more interesting features of the Athenian uh, houses that we have found. The Athenian home was a very gendered place, but as we'll see, there's always a difference between theory and practice. The main dining area where the family would gather to eat as a whole was known as the Andron because one of its other purposes was to host male guests. So it's the men's quarter. And by and large, if you are a visitor and you're not either a very close family friend or a male relative, this is the only part of another home that you would ever see. You wouldn't ever see the rest of the house. You might get to go into the kitchen if you want to grab more wine or whatever, but for the most part, this is the designated area for visitors, and beyond that point, visitors were not welcome. The women's quarters, the gynaikia, were occupied by women, girls, and young boys, typically boys under about seven years old or so. After that point, they start spending a little bit more time with their dads and start to spend more time in public. This was far and away the largest part of the home. The majority of the home was sort of under the heading of the gynaikia. And these parts of the home would be harder to access. It would either be upstairs or in one of the back rooms. And the reason for this largely is that especially with upper class Athenians, there was an ideal that women, or at least wives, would be kept separate from the public, that citizens would not know one another's wives, lest they should have an adulterous affair. The problem with that, of course, is that the Athenians very much prized citizenship, and if someone's legitimacy were challenged, that is to say, if someone um, had an affair and possibly tainted a bloodline, then what that might result in is the loss of citizenship for the kids. And that could have some dire consequences. This could mean the loss of the right to own land. It could mean the loss of political rights. So the consequences of adultery for people of childbearing age, at least, could be dire. And by the way, um, you could take some pretty dramatic actions as a man if you thought your wife was having an affair, which include murdering the man who has... Uh, gotten with your wife and doing so with your friends, as long as you have witnesses and you can prove that he was an adulterer, you can murder him right out in public. You also have the option of taking him outside in the same way and instead of murdering him, shoving a raw radish up his anus. So the Athenians very much took this seriously. Now in theory, men were supposed to spend most of their time in public and attend to how the family dealt with the larger world. They also spent a lot of their time engaging in politics. Women, on the other hand, were supposed to stay at home, manage the household, and also manage the family's finances. So when a man would go out, he would actually get his daily allowance from his wife, even though in theory he was in charge, but in practice should keep the books. Now, what's interesting about this sort of theory versus practice breakdown here is that women often did leave the home, citizen wives that is, even wealthy citizen wives who were women of leisure. We have found plenty of dedications from both Athens proper and Attica broadly which indicate that citizen wives often traveled around to different shrines and made dedications and often visited the, the um, agora to buy things. So we know that they did not live a cloistered life, although that kind of was the ideal. And as we'll see, even though in theory women were just responsible for maintaining the household, weaving and other things like that, a woman's work actually encompassed basically anything one could theoretically imagine needing to be done. Materially speaking, Athenian houses were relatively simple. Each one of them had a stone foundation. Athenian homes were not dug into the ground the way that some modern houses are, but rather they sat upon a low stone foundation that stood about a foot or so above the ground, maybe a bit more. Most of the exterior, 
of the home would be built out of mud brick, which was fairly easy to make and inexpensive. The interior walls were typically painted plaster surfaces, since so allowed for decoration, and it also was a little bit more pleasant to the touch than, say, mud brick like you have on the outside. To keep water out of the home and to keep things dry, they had roofing tiles made out of terracotta. And most other parts of the home, including windows, doors, porches, balconies, and stairs, would all be made out of wood, of course. So, Athenian homes, in terms of the materials you would need, didn't really require anything too fancy. The main challenge to building a home in Athens is that, especially if you're working in the city itself, it is very hilly, and there are some homes that had to be dug into the side of the Penix Hill and some other locations where you really had to modify the design to some extent to deal with the local terrain. If you're looking at an Athenian house out in the countryside, it would be a much simpler affair because you'd be able to find a nice patch of flat ground and then the workshop area would be used as a storeroom and so the house would be much uh, easier to figure out. Another thing to consider is that when you're siting your various parts of the home, you have to uh, consider the lay of the roads, and Athens was not a planned community, so this means that the roads were irregular, and so you might have to modify the layout of your home to some extent to make sure that either your workshop or your andron is facing a public thoroughfare. But for the most part, um, figuring this out would have not been too difficult, and also the building materials would have been fairly abundant. One of the more underappreciated facts about democratic Athens is that the vast majority of free people worked for themselves and were not dependent on others for their living. There were no large companies or large employers. Most people who had what we might think of as an employee were slave owners. It was very rare for one free man to pay another for services. There were state projects where somebody could make a living, say, from the city itself as they worked on a temple or what have you, but for the most part, Athenians were self-reliant. And that meant working from home, and if you lived in the city, one of the most common ways to make a living would be to own and operate a workshop. You could be a leather worker, you could make shoes, you could work with metal, you could build shields, you could be a potter, you could be one of the people who made Athens famous black figure pottery from the archaic or the red figure pottery from the classical period. Now a lot of uh, pottery manufacturers operated on a bigger scale but there were some small timers as well. Whatever your business was though usually it would operate from home. And just like the men's quarter, but to a greater extent, the idea is that because this is the place where a man works primarily, you need to keep this separate from the public to protect the women and children. So, the workshops do not have connecting doors to the living quarters of the home. Now, many craftsmen were very small time. And this means that they effectively worked not only for themselves, but by themselves. When they did get assistance, what it appears like is that the majority of the assistance that they received came from their own wives. So in many cases, these craftsmen who would get married at around the age of 30 to women who were about 18 or so would train their wives to know the craft and be able to help them out with it. This would especially be important with potters because when a pot is being made you have a very limited amount of time in which to paint scenes on it if you're doing more fancy pottery. And so having two people work on it at once would help with that process immensely. So one person could work on the outer decor while another person paints the figures. Most likely though if you're running a mom and pop shop you would be making much more basic stuff that's just for everyday use and not the more decorative pieces that you see here. <coughs> uh, other family members of course can participate as well. If you have children who are 
relatively mature. They can be helpful if you have elderly parents who might not really be able to work full time anymore but can still be useful here and there. They could participate. And if you own slaves, typically they also helped out in these kinds of tasks as well. Large scale workshops are not the same thing really. Uh, they would typically have their own dedicated building and the owners, once these things reach a certain scale, are not going to be very hands-on. So for instance, the richest Athenian ever was the politician Nicias, and he owned a number of businesses and it is very unlikely that he ever really uh, got his hands dirty at any of them. One of them was a massive shield factory where they would build hoplite shields and then sell them to the citizen hoplites of Athens. It's very unlikely that Nicias himself ever went there and assembled a shield. He had people doing it for him, almost all of whom were slaves he owned, because he owned a thousand slaves, and quite a few of them were skilled craftsmen. As I mentioned earlier, we typically have to look at analogous homes from other polis in order to get a good sense of what was going on in Athenian houses. Most walls had a baseboard that was about a foot tall. This would very much correspond with the stone sockle on the outside. And then you'd have the main wall above that, which would be painted one solid color, white, red, yellow, or black. That would serve as a background. And then from there you could paint additional decoration. Most of the wall paintings at Athens have not been terribly well preserved, but we do know from other Greek polis that typically artistic scenes would be painted. We normally associate Greek art with a lot of human figures, with a lot of mythological scenes and things of that nature, but actually it looks like a lot of home decor was more nature themed, as we see in the restored mosaic that you see on the screen. In terms of furniture, most Athenian homes do not seem to have had very much. Most likely, they had so little that when they switched activities from room to room, they'd have to take their furniture around with them. So furniture was mostly light and fairly small. Uh, chairs would be sort of wooden frames within a linen webbing that you would use to hold the person. The most sort of well-known uh, Greek furniture would be the dining couches that would be in the Andron. Uh, Greeks liked to recline while they ate. Some dining couches could hold multiple people. Some were single person affairs. just kind of depended. As for bathrooms, Athenian homes did not have very fancy baths at all. Most homes had no running water. This was a very rare thing to have and a bathroom would be more or less limited to buckets and seats and then you also had a large wash basin that you could use to heat up water to take a bath or to wash your clothes. So um, there were no real elaborate uh, rituals when it came to bathing and while Athens did have a couple of public bathhouses um, for the most part on a day-to-day -day basis you would not really bathe too much. Or if you did so, you'd do so at home and it would be pretty limited. You just heat up some water and wipe yourself down. Thanks in no small part to the fame of Plato's Symposium, Symposia are among the best known cultural activities of the Athenians. A Symposium is a drinking party mostly featuring men and these would be held in the Andron. Regardless of a man's status or the wealth of his household, an Andron was typically only about 19 by 17 feet. These vary a little bit from house to house, but those are about the typical dimensions. And this allows for about nine dining couches. Each couch, as I mentioned, can hold about two people typically. So we're thinking about 18 people show up to any given symposium. And this would become such a well-known rule or standard that later in the Hellenistic period when kings would build massive palaces and be able to host hundreds of people at a time in a symposium, it would be considered to be barbaric or uncultured if men would leave their little area of uh, nine or so couches. 
So the idea is that you should just have a bunch of separate symposia just artificially divided into little areas of this massive structure. And that's because in the classical period, this is how the Athenians did it. So this is the proper way to do it. But the only reason the Athenians did it this way is because that was what they had to work with architecturally. Those are the rooms they had. So it's kind of interesting how that worked out culturally, how this became a great cultural standard just based on necessity. Most symposia were pretty casual affairs, and they frequently were crashed by passers-by, sometimes just looking to connect socially, sometimes looking for free food. And it would be considered bad manners to turn someone away from a symposium, especially if you are a wealthy host, because that would make you look like you are not generous. Symposiums or symposia are typically associated with men of wealth who are trying to cultivate friends and impress people with their wealth. And actually, this is kind of how Athenians would show their class status more so than their house. What they would show is that they're able to afford the finer things in life. So, for instance, if you were a poorer person hosting a symposium, most likely you'd only have finger foods that consisted of bread products and occasionally a few vegetables, figs especially. If you're a wealthy person, say a politician like Pericles, and you're hosting a symposium, you want to really show off. So you get fish, which is very expensive. And you get a lot of wine, so people won't run out. And you get better quality wine. And also you hire entertainment, you hire musicians. Even a fairly modest party could have one flute girl there to play. But you might get multiple flute girls get some dancers, and sometimes the dancers are young men, sometimes they're women, and you could also get hatairai. Uh, these are basically courtesans or high-class prostitutes who are there to both comfort, entertain, and converse with men, as well as to do other things I think are obvious. And this was just sort of a standard thing that most aristocratic men throughout the Greek world kind of did. But in Athens, these parties were especially famous because they had a lot of the leading lights of the Greek world, and so you'd have people like Socrates attending these parties. Uh, these specifically elite parties, it was also not unknown for people to get into political debates and to converse on topics of great importance, such as philosophy. So even though these could be drunken revels to some extent, they also could be times of great intellectual exchange. And usually speaking, Greeks did not drink to the point of passing out or vomiting the way that Romans did. So even though these guys might become a little glib of tongue due to drink, they're not necessarily going to get absolutely wasted, and they will still be pretty functional while uh, participating. Another thing that's interesting, and another big difference between Greek and Roman culture, is that whereas in Roman culture it's considered to be uncivilized for a man of wealth to participate in singing or dancing, in Athens most gentlemen did study music and so they would often take over music playing and, <coughs> and dancing duties. And because upper class men would network with each other and connect with each other in this way and because uh, eminent guests who were from outside the city would show up to these parties, a lot of Plato's dialogues, which feature great philosophers of the time, such as Parmenides, uh, he would mention some... <coughs> he'd mention the symposia. Or he set um, a great conversation between Alcibiades and Socrates at a symposium. So this was something that was at the center of the social life of the Greek world, and especially at Athens. One of the most common finds in Athens from the classical period are urms. Urms are statues designed to guard against evil spirits. The idea being that if evil spirits are wandering the streets, they will turn around and leave when confronted by an urm. An urm is a rectangular block of stone with a human head on top and then fully articulated genitals at the bottom. Often there is a very large erection that is portrayed. 
And urms were built over a long period of time, meaning that some urms are from the archaic period and they had a different art style like the one on the left, so it would be more old looking. Or they are fully articulated and more in the classical tradition of architecture and they might even portray a specific person. The urm on the right is actually a little bit post-classical and it represents the Mosthenes, who was the great orator of the late years of the Athenian democracy. So, urms were found all over Athens. They protected public buildings from evil spirits and they also warded off evil from private homes. Typically speaking, the public urms were a little bit newer and more advanced than the private ones, but still, um, these all sort of function the same way and had a similar design. While we might think of the urms as just sort of an artistic choice or as sort of a kind of window dressing for Athens, if you will, these actually did hold great significance in Athens because the religious purpose that they served is something that the Athenians very much believed in. And they associated the urms with the safety and security of the Democritia as a whole. One night, there were a lot of symposia going on, and just as with every time that's the case, a number of young men got really drunk. The next morning, a number of urms were broken, and the way that they were broken is that the penises were uh, detached. And this would take a fairly strong person to pull this off, because these are made out of stone or concrete. And this was along the Scythe Maker Street. This led to a massive investigation and a witch hunt. And the person who was mostly identified as the culprit was the politician Alcibiades, who was known to be a somewhat skeptical guy when it came to religion and for being kind of a prankster in general. And rather than seeing this as a prank or even as just a destruction of public and private property, a lot of people actually saw this as a plot against the Democritia itself. They thought that Alcibiades was endangering the health of the community as a whole by dealing such a blow to the guardians of homes and public buildings. So this actually ended up destroying Alcibiades' career and he ended up going into exile over this. So one thing to keep in mind is that when the Athenians talk about their religious beliefs at the time, these are things that they very much did believe very deeply and these were very much ingrained into their lives. Another detail is that most Athenian homes, as we saw in the diagram at the very beginning, had an altar either in the courtyard or somewhere in the deep interior of their home and that one of the things that they would do when a new member of the household came in is introduce them to the gods of their family and officially make them a part of the family. And this is actually an invitation that was extended even to slaves. So not just newborn babies, but also even freshly purchased slaves would be inducted into the household before the gods. So, just keep in mind that while the urms in modern terms look a little weird, these are very important to the Athenians, and no home would have been complete without one of these out front. So that is all I have for you when it comes to Athenian private life. Next time we'll take a look at the monumental architecture of Athens and how it relates to the Democritia as a whole.